Um, let's see here. So Jose Angel is a human, a student, a teacher, a husband, a father, a prolific writer, an author, an interpreter, a translator, a public intellectual, and a public speaker. He has spoken at Cal State and many other universities. He recently gave the Dean's Distinguished Lecture at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, titled From Dishwasher to Public Speaker, The Power of Higher Education. So please help me welcome Jose Angel. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Can you understand me? Okay, very good. Because I've been working, I've been preparing for this moment for a very long time. I've been training this voice for more than 24 years, just so I could come here today and have this very conversation with each one of you. I know this probably doesn't make any sense right now, but I hope that by the end of my talk, it will all come together. I know that most of you are enrolled in a course that explores what it means to be a stranger, or how we perceive a stranger, and why. So I thought that maybe a good idea for our conversation today would be for me to try to illustrate something that you may not necessarily be familiar with, that is, the intimate life of someone who you might consider a stranger for several reasons. One, because he doesn't speak your language. Two, because he might seem reclusive. And three, because the very presence of this person among you might constitute a social problem. I came to the United States over 24 years ago. And the very first thing I realized was that I was unable to understand this new society. First, because the language that was spoken here was not my own. And second, because it was obvious that this country operated with a different set of rules. I was also impressed by what seemed to be unlimited wealth the serpentine shape of the highways, the huge verdant suburban lawns, the glaring shopping malls, the skyscrapers, the enthusiasm and the productivity of the people. Here, all things spoke differently. They spoke the language of possibility. I found myself in the land of plenty where as opposed to the place I had come from, achievement was within reach. The contrast, the contrast with the place I had come from was so sharp that to allude to the German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, this new place resembled an idea. And removed as I was initially from it because of the language barrier it remained an abstraction for me, but I will to possess it, to make it part of my concrete reality. When I moved here, some of the people I lived with had been living in Chicago for a very long time. And nonetheless, I noticed that many had not yet learned English, and some were not even interested in doing so for reasons I never understood. Perhaps because of our proximity to wealth, the contrast I saw between the Chicago where I lived and the world that surrounded us was startling. At the place where I lived, the echoes of poverty, resignation, and apathy that were so familiar back in Mexico seemed to be amplified. It was as though the whole of Mexico had multiplied and landed squarely there, on the kitchen table, in the living room, in the mold-smelling basement bedroom where I slept. Mexico oozed out of the radio and the television. 
It spoke to us in her comforting maternal voice. And when we most needed to be awake, her tender voice lulled us back to sleep. Thus, I found myself transported to a different country, but without really living in it, without participating in its life. It was like I never left Mexico. Rather, it seemed as though I had traveled deeper inside instead. Not too long before, I had put my life on the line when crossing the border. But now, the challenge before me was of a different nature. Already inside the walls of empire, I was free to walk in broad daylight. I went about my new home without understanding a single word, unable to decipher its symbols, dazzled by its imposing presence, by its complex and shiny verticality. One of my earlier memories of my life in Chicago is going to a shopping mall with a cousin. He needed to buy a pair of shoes. His seven-year-old daughter came along with us. Upon arriving to the mall, I realized why. She was there to serve as an interpreter for my cousin, who could not communicate, even at the very basic level required when asking for a specific shoe size and color, eight and a half or nine, brown or black. It was at that very moment that I realized I did not want that for myself. If I was to make of this my new home, I did not want that, I did not want to depend on the linguistic charity of other people to, perf to perform such an elemental activity as buying a new pair of shoes. At that moment, without a good grasp of English, I was nothing but a bundle of flesh and bone, still waiting for the breath of life. I only half existed. My effect on others was no greater than that of a cabinet, a stop sign, a park bench. I was voiceless in my new home, but I, I might as well have been unborn. Thus, out of a pressing need to exist, I realized in a very Cartesian fashion that first I must, as my, I must learn to speak and only then could I be. In his inquiry into the origin of language, Charles Darwin concludes that the first humans to use it employed it courting females, seducing them for reproduction. If that was the case, then I was more than happy to court the English language, to go and dance around it until I could possess it. My new language, I reasoned, would guide me out of obscurity. It will be a torch leading me out of the shadows of anonymity and onto broad daylight. I was determined to learn English, so I asked people if I could register for classes somewhere. When I was informed of a place nearby, I signed up, and a few months after arriving in Chicago, I started going to classes every morning and was so excited that I was one of the first persons to get there, even before the teachers. Learning English was clearly important to me. It was a sign of my early desire to become part of this society and my first step in the right direction. But there were things I could not foresee or know about at the time. For instance, whether or not you can still reproduce the sounds you hear around you when you are a grown up. I later realized that one of the disadvantages of learning a language as an adult is that one's tongue has stiffened. The mastery of a new language requires an elastic tongue, a responsive and lively tongue, and mine had become robotic and languid. An unfortunate encounter confirmed this for me. 
one Friday morning, only weeks after starting ESL classes, I was pulled over by a police officer. I knew what the problem was, a broken turn signal. I had plans to fix it that weekend. When the officer asked me whether I knew why he had stopped me, I tried to explain, but I lacked the necessary language, so I said, yes, the directionals no work. The officer was empathetic and asked me to try again. And I did, I said, the directionals, he then seemed confused. After a couple of other unsuccessful attempts, his face began to transform. He became visibly impatient. He looked irritated. Determined to stop the onslaught of his language, he finally asked, do you even speak English? Shortly after, he let me go with a warning and I drop, drop off to ESL classes where I refused to speak all day. At 20 years of age, when I began to study English, my vocal habits were already formed. The new prospect was exciting, but for a tongue accustomed to an ebb and flow from different depths, the twists and swirls of a new language were, and still are, overwhelming challenges. In my new language, my tongue stumbles. I utter screeching noises. No matter how much, how much I might love the English language, its guttural sounds, the biting of the lower lip, the buzzing sound, the vibration of the tongue, the oral wealth that pours like honey out of others, all that has proven to be beyond my linguistic abilities. And the fact that I can complain about it in writing brings no consolation. Because my, ex my exposure to English came so late in life, I now understand that it was quite unrealistic to expect that I would learn to speak it perfectly. By the time I started ESL classes, I could no longer discriminate new sounds. And many times, even now, when I come across new words, my instinct is to pronounce them the way I see them spelled, forgetting that English has so many exceptions to the rule and so many sounds that for a Spanish speaker simply don't exist. I am referring to words like manmouth or manmath, Menmath, yeah. you get the idea, right? I have spoken to you about my decision to learn English and some of the difficulties I have encountered along the way. Now, let's move forward many, many years to 2007 or so. By this time, I have learned English, gotten my GED, gone to college and grad school, and I find myself working as a professional translator. I sit in an air-conditioned office. I wear a tie. I own a condo within walking distance to Lake Michigan. It is the first time I am employed in a professional setting like this, with benefits, like paid vacations, something unprecedented in my entire life. What else could I ask of America? I, who one night had sneaked through her back door, was now being extended this one benefit exclusive of her first class citizens? Of course, I had no illusions, no plans of going anywhere. After all, lacking proper, proper legal documentation also means lacking mobility. I always knew that, and I would have been fine staying put in Chicago, just, uh, just the way I had since I first arrived in the city 14 years before. However, by becoming a professional, I had also entered the middle class. And one of the constant topics of conversation with my colleagues at the office, I found, was that of vacations. Previously, 
I had spent many years of my life working at a restaurant where mostly everyone else was also undocumented. So the casual conversations about going on vacation, about going abroad on vacation, were completely foreign to me. Something I knew nothing about and which I even lacked the vocabulary to describe. Expressions like landings, connections, missed flights, and frequent flyer miles were a mystery to me. Now, since my new co-workers at the office didn't know about my immigration status, they obviously didn't know I couldn't travel. But that was not something I could share with them. So during my first two years of work, whenever someone asked me where I'd be going on vacation, I simply say nowhere. I would tell them I was planning a big trip to Europe, but needed to accrue more vacation time, save enough money, plan well. And this will take a couple of years. Thus, the first two years went by without any problems. By the third year, however, people started getting curious. The questions became more and more frequent. They wanted to know where I'd be landing, Paris or London. Was I planning a shorter trip during the summer? At around this time, Michael, a co-worker, invited people from the office to his house. It was a nice dinner. He and his wife traveled constantly. I admired and envy their picture collection. It extends far and wide from Jerusalem to Santo Domingo. Showing, he, showing me his latest pictures from Rio, he asked me how my plans for Europe were going. How long had it been since I, ha since I had been to Mexico? Why didn't I join them with a group of other people for the next weekend trip to Yellowstone? It was still a month and a half away, more than enough time to make plans and find tickets on the same flight. Sure, I'll let you know, I answer, smiling broadly. The following year, having accumulated enough vacation time and having run out of excuses for not going on vacation, I invented one for myself. I told those who asked that I was on my way to visit my family, that I was going to visit my family in Mexico in January and stay there for about two weeks. I didn't go anywhere. For a whole week, I stayed home, warmly dressed and happy not to, go, not to have to go out into the Arctic cold that subdued Chicago those days. When Sunday came though, the city experienced an unusually high temperature for that time of the year. I decided to go out, but needed to hide from my co-workers, many of whom lived in my neighborhood and whom I will often run into strolling down Michigan Avenue on the weekends. I needed a plan. So as though it were still cold, I bundled up before leaving the house. I put on a hoodie, a winter hat, an old, uh, an old warm coat I never wore. I wrapped the thickest of my scarves around my neck. It hit half my face and my nose, leaving only my eyes uncovered. Nobody would recognize me like this. I could stand right next to any of my coworkers and they will have no idea that it was I. To prove it, I actually hope to run into one of them. With all my layers, I will, I will walk in front of them and then back, taking small, heavy, bouncy steps, like one wearing an astronaut suit. My vacation. It served only to accentuate my solitude, to remind me of my illegality, to oppress me even more. Strolling along Michigan Avenue, a group of tall young athletes went by wearing only shorts and light fleeces. One of them looked my way, and like some playful and childish giant, he pointed down at me with his right index finger and laughed out loud. With a high adolescent pitch, he muttered something, 
mocking me. I felt embarrassed and began to sweat even more underneath my winter clothes. So far, I have spoken to you about two moments that really marked the course of my life in this country. One, my need to communicate with the larger society. And two, my need to hide even from those close to me, like my former co-workers. This dual reality, which is not uncommon for people in a situation similar to mine, had a very powerful impact on me. So much so that I became a hybrid creature of darkness and hope. One who could scratch the heights of prosperity, but who remained permanently rooted in misfortune. If these two extremes in the spectrum of my experience seem mutually exclusive, it's because they are. But there has been another component of my experience that has allowed me to bring these two streams together, my college education. It was because of a conversation like this that I can stand here today. I mean, it was only because one day I was able to sit in a classroom at a community college where ideas having to do with the nature of reality were being discussed, that many years later, I will be able to articulate my personal dilemma in the narrative of hope and deception found in this book. But why am I saying this? I am saying this because even if most of you who are just starting college don't realize it right now, some of the lessons that you are about to learn, some of the books that you are about to read during your time in college will either challenge or confirm the way that you see the world, the way that you relate to people around you. But most importantly, they will help you understand your own place in the world and the values that you bring to it. Because believe it or not, there will come a time when each one of you in your respective fields will have to make decisions that will impact the lives of other people. Those decisions will be moral or ethical or social or economic in nature, but they will all involve the higher order of your humanity. That is, the way that you understand your own place in the world and how you are connected to others. Some of the decisions that you make when you go out into the professional world will have important social repercussions. Your decisions may even determine what happens to me after living in this country for longer than some of you have been alive. Your decisions will affect what happens to my wife, whose family has been in this country for more than 150 years. And you may even decide what happens to a whole generation of American-born children, including my own daughter. Again, those decisions that you make will be reflected in the society that you choose to live in in the future. It is possible that you don't know yet what your role in society will be. I certainly didn't know what mine was when I went to college. The same way that 24 years ago, when I first crossed the border, I could not have imagined that I would have the honor to be here speaking to you from the perspective of a stranger. But am I really a stranger to you? And if so, why? Perhaps it was unconsciously thinking about this very issue that I wrote this book, which is an attempt of a person to use the language he learned as an adult to voice a very complex and misunderstood social problem. I am talking about a problem in which each one of us is involved. The labor of the undocumented in this country. Sometimes 
when I am invited to share my experience as an undocumented man with different communities, I often find myself puzzled by the misconceptions I encounter. An older German stands up and demands one goddamn good reason not to call the police on me at that very moment. But then we will not be able to have a discussion, I answer. I am aware of the significance of our conversation. That brief exchange alone is, of is already of great value. Just by engaging in it, we are both carrying on in the tradition of the town hall meeting, which some people consider to be one of the main pillars of American democracy. It is clear that we come with different agendas. The man is determined to uphold the rule of law. I am forced to defend my humanity. In the end, our conversation bears towards the subject of the economy. He insists that people like me drive down wages for, Amer for American workers. I tell him we make it possible for Americans to live comfortably and affordably. As a retiree, he should be an ally of the undocumented. The Social Security Administration having retained $100 billion from our paychecks during the last decade alone. He remains skeptical. His version of America does not allow for an outlaw funding his retirement. One of the reasons that motivated me to write this book was to dispel the notion that we, the undocumented, are strangers among you when we're really not. We live with you throughout the day, every day of the year. If you pay attention, you can notice us since early in the morning, in the fruits and berries that you eat for breakfast, or in the afternoons when you eat lunch at different restaurants, or during some of the most solemn occasions of the year, like Thanksgiving, when you're slicing the turkey that has likely been raised by undocumented immigrants, or the next time you dig your teeth into an apple from a Washington orchard, or when watching football and eating pizza. All of those are industries where the undocumented toil and sweat so that each one of us can count on the goods and services needed to function properly in society. A society that still refuses to recognize the essential role of the undocumented. A society that still has to find the courage and the moral integrity to grant basic human rights to 11 million of its inhabitants. I understand how complicated this problem is and how passionate many people feel about it. However, while this petty political system decides what to do with us, and in spite of the hypocrisy and the toxic rhetoric coming out of Washington, D.C., the work and the contributions of the undocumented continues today. At dairy farms and restaurant, kit restaurant kitchens and factories around the country, or in a chapel in a liberal arts college in Illinois, because we're no strangers to you or to your way of life. This brings me back to my opening remarks. Can you all hear me? Can you understand me? Thank you all so much for your time. I think we have time for questions. We have two microphones, so you have to come up and speak at one of them, please. One at a time.
so in your, like as you were closing, you were talking about how you wanted to uh, kind of work towards more human basic rights for the undocumented. And so in our reading for class, we had to read the first chapter of your book. And in it, you describe yourself, you almost incriminate yourself, like you described yourself as a thief or like that you felt like a thief or that you were an intruder. If you're, like, like you said, your intent is to fight for, or, you, know, uh, you know, get more human rights for the undocumented, why did you speak of yourself in such a way in uh, your first chapter, or our reading for ILA? Right, well, thanks. Uh, that was deliberate, and uh, what I was trying to do is to obviously uh, do better writing. I one of the things that I can't stand is uh, talk of uh, when it comes to such a complicated issue uh, to see things either in black or white. I think they're more complicated than that. So by showing you the moral deliberation that I was going through when crossing the border and going to somebody's lawn to drink water, it felt it, it, it felt wrong for me to be doing that at that time of the night. Uh, at the same time, the reasons that were propelling me to do that, you know, they're beyond me. I mean, that, that's not something that I can control. You know, this is part of the global economy. Uh, so something was wrong, and there is something wrong when, when people are forced to go to other countries in such conditions, rather than just being able to have a, your passport stamped with a visa so you can come, do some work, and go back, if, if that's the case, go back uh, to, to your home country and then come back again. But such conditions don't exist. What I was trying to do in this particular passage that you mentioned was simply trying to illustrate you know, how complicated it is for a person like me you know, when you're crossing and all those uh, moral deliberations that are going through our heads. So, um, in your uh, writing that we read, the ex excerpt from your book, um, you left basically, well, yeah, you left everything uh, dialogue-wise in Spanish. Can you uh, tell me why you did that? Yeah, I, uh, that was also deliberate because it, it, I just wanted to give people an idea of what, how it feels when you are immersed in a society where you don't really understand what's going on. And uh, I don't know if there was a lot of Spanish. I, I think there were a, a couple of sentences in Spanish, not a whole lot. So, uh, I mean, it, it, was, it was just to give you an idea of how people might feel when, uh, when they're trying to like understand other people who speak different languages and are being left out. So that, that, was, uh, that was the main, that was the main goal, just to, you know, just to, to try people under, get people to understand where I was coming from, the way that I felt about, you know, society and how I didn't understand it before. So I kind of wanted to convey the same idea. Um, in your passage, you stated, like, after you did what you did, you felt so humiliated, and you said, like, if you were to get caught, you would never attempt it again, but yet you did. So what made you decide to be so persistent in order to continue your journey? Yeah, well, I was already there at the border, and I had a place to go to. You know, I, I heard that there were places in, um, in Chicago where you could go and get a, a, a job washing dishes for $5.75 an hour, and that to me was inconceivable. Being a Mexican, 19-year-old at the time, earning 575 was nothing, I mean, really, if you consider it, it's not that much. Uh, I, I, I kind of wanted that, I, I, and I think that if I would have des decided to like quit and go back to Mexico, uh, I don't know, I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation to begin with, and uh, I would have felt like a failure, which I already was to begin with, and plus, that, that's like a rite of passage. 
at this, you know, at this age, from the social, coming from the social background where I come from, I, I think that's just like a given. That is what you do. Uh, that's what you do, or you end up having a, a job that doesn't take you anywhere, just making very little money. So that, I, I felt like, you know, I was already there, and you know, I tried again, and you know, I'm here. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Uh, so earlier today you talked about everyone having their own agenda. How do you think that there can be some bipartisan agreement on such a hotly co uh, contested issue? Uh, in other words, how can we bridge the gap with right. uh, both sides politically? Well, I, I think there there has to be political will to do this, right? I mean, that uh, because it doesn't matter if we, I mean, if I come here and speak to you and you know you might be persuaded one way or another but in order for us to like uh, convince our, our politicians that you know some people tend to be dogmatic about certain aspects of the, of the law what I'm trying to tell them is that yes okay so if you think people didn't come the right way okay so there are certain penalties that you, you can put like there's a uh, certain fines or whatnot, and we can work work all that out. But there is no political will, and I, I think I and I have a theory about that. I mean, by not fixing the problem, people get elected to office. If they fix a the problem, they they have to find some you know a different platform to to run on. So that that's why they don't want to fix it. And that that's my but that's my opinion. You know, that's something I've been observing for over 20 years. I mean, look at the place where we're at right now. You know, about, I can't remember when it was, 2013, I can't remember. But they passed a bill in the Senate that was not perfect, and I didn't agree with all these components, but uh, it, was, it was a good bill to start. But, you know, it, it, never, it was never, never even brought for a vote in the House. So that's, uh, it just tells you that, you know, people are not interested in solving this problem. And the same, same thing happened back in 2006, 2007. There was another bill, the, the Kennedy-McCain uh, bill in the Senate that passed, but you know, it didn't go anywhere in the House. So those people in the House are getting elected on this very issue. But at the same time, there's a lot of hypocrisy because they're not rounding out 11 million people and sending them back because of their economy. It will suffer. The economy will suffer. It has suffered in the past when measures like this have been taken in Georgia, in Alabama, back, look, I can give you the data, back in 2012, 2013, they passed some very draconian laws, you know, criminalizing undocumented immigrants, and they left. They left the, the, those states, and what happened? What happened was that, you know, all the crops, all the vegetables and fruits went bad. People, there weren't people there to pick them, so they, they ended up losing over $100 million. And what did they do to solve the problem? They went to the prisons. They took out prisoners to work on the fields. But they didn't have to do it. They said, well, no, screw you. I'm not doing this work. I have no need to do it. And they, they didn't do it. They ended up losing. So that, I mean, when, when you have an argument like that to make before a politician, they, what, can possibly, what can they possibly tell you? I mean, yes, they're going to say, well, you, you didn't come the right way. Okay, well, there wasn't a way to come. They say, go back to the other line. There's no line to begin with. You know? So that, that's, uh, I mean, show them the, the numbers and, you know, personal stories like this and many others. That's what I will do. How your book would be different? How would you express yourself if it were to be written in Spanish? What more do you think you could say if your book were to be written in Spanish? Um, well, the, there was a reason why I wrote it uh, in English. It's because I wanted to talk to you, to each one of you, to all of you, uh, about this problem. Because otherwise, writing this book in Spanish will be just preaching to the choir, right? And we, we know and we understand our problem. So that, that's why I don't write it in Spanish. Having said that, uh, I don't know how it's going to read in Spanish. It's been translated at the moment. I mean, I, I just think of it as 
being something really weird because that's my first language and somebody else is translating a book that I wrote into a second language into my first language. And it's a, it's a professional Mexican author too, so it's just weird. Any other questions? to like tra transition into a culture that was new to you compared to an old culture that was new to him. Like, how was that transition like? like well, I, it? yeah, no, that's a really good question. I, I don't think there's, uh, I, I can't really talk about the whole transition because I'm not there. I mean, that, 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 that's what it means when, if you ask anybody who has ever lived in a certain place for a number of years and they go back to their own country, they say, well, this is not my home anymore. I, I don't feel quite at home anymore. But when you're back in the country where you you are an invited guest or whatnot, uh, you don't feel completely, completely comfortable either. So people like me, we inhabit this kind of limbo. And that, that's, that's the way that we live. It, it's like a, I don't know, like a third space. It's not really quite home, but it's not not home. You know what I mean? So that's, uh, that transition is, is permanent. It, there, there's not like one clear cut, you know, like crossing the street into a different culture. That, that's not the case. It's like you live in between cultures and languages. Yeah. Great, well, oh, sorry. Oh, we'll finish there. Uh, and again, if you have more questions, please uh, don't hesitate to visit us at from three to four in McMichael uh, Academic Building. Very good, thank you so much. Thank you all.